Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to the Brown Bag Seminar that will be presented by uh, Dr. Santiago Lopez Ridaura. I think the microphone is not working. Hello? Good afternoon? No. Hola, hello? No, no, the, the micro is not working yet. Hello? No. Ah, oh, okay, okay, it's ready, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the Brown Bank Seminar that will be presented by Santiago Lopez Ridaura. Uh, the seminar is entitled Agriculture and Food Security in the Western Highlands of Guatemala. Uh, Santiago Lopez Ridaura is a scientist in the Sustainable Intensification Program of CIMIT. He studied agriculture engineering in the University Autónoma in the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico, and has a master's degree on sustainable agriculture by Y uh, College uh, at the University of London, and a PhD in production ecology and resource conservation by the Wageningen University at, Net at the Netherlands. Uh, Santiago has worked over 15 years on the application of systems approaches in agriculture in several countries of Latin America, Asia, Europe, and Africa. His main research experience and interests are related to systems analysis at the farm household level, the multi-criteria assessment of agricultural systems through sustainability indicators, and the use of models of, uh, for assessing future scenarios of agriculture development at different scales. So, thank you so much. Bye. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here, also to those uh, online. So I'm going to present some of the work that we did in Guatemala in the context of the Buena Milpa project. I think it's time that we really socialize the products of this project because there were many different elements from participatory breeding, soil and water conservation, so I think we can sort of get into a series of seminars to capitalize and socialize on this project, which is over. The work I will present today is one of the elements of this project, which is about food security at the household level in the, in the region, which I did together with Luis and Christian, which was a research assistant here, now finishing a PhD in one, with John Helling, that was working also in the project, now he's in IRRI, Bruno and Marvan Weick, which is from uh, Ilri, and with whom we have developed a lot of the quantitative tools that we are applying. Uh, just to give you a bit of context, uh, Guatemala, uh, our neighbor country, is one of the poorest countries of the, of the world. Uh, it has the highest level of child malnutrition in the Western Hemisphere, uh, which is quite uh, impressive. They compete with uh, IT. Uh, uh, and the fourth highest in the world, that's the World Food Program who said that. Most of the population that lives in this situation lives in the rural areas, it's not the urban population, where agriculture is their main activity. And many of these, uh, and this is especially concentrated within indigenous population, because they are rural and rural population in Guatemala. There are different types of, of, of ethnic groups. Uh, and these communities are mainly concentrated in the western highlands of Guatemala, and that's the reason that Buena Milpa and the USAID Feed the Future program was focalized in that region. So this is Guatemala. This is the, the western highlands of Guatemala where we developed the project, which as you can see, it's a very mountainous region with altitudes above 3,000 meters above sea level, uh, and it's a difficult region, let's say. Beautiful landscape. High, high density of, uh, of people, high pressure on the, the natural resources. Mm -hmm. As you can see, these mountains are totally covered uh, of agricultural fields. As it is quite mountainous region, it's quite isolated from markets and things like that. So this is a map made by Kai on the time to travel to a market. And so as you can see, it's most of the region is uh, about one hour. Well, as you can see, there is a very difficult situation with a, a slow plant with higher ocean, uh, like that. We made a, Kai and, and John made a map of erosion risk uh, and interesting, and we used some of these uh, tools that I will present here 
to also target soil and water conservation practices in, in the region. Maybe one day Kai and or someone can give a talk on that. So our study area is five departments in the in the Western Highlands of Guatemala, Huehuetenango, Quiche, San Marcos, Tonicampan, y Quetzaltenango, which is just in the border with uh, Mexico. No? Now the research questions that we had for this uh, specific study was what are the main farming activities and what are the main differences between farm types in the region? No? What is the relationship between these types and these farming activities with the food security? No? And if we can find some patterns linking food security level to farm types. The expectation of this is that the results of this kind of work could help research and development, notably development institutions, to target their interventions to improve agricultural production or food security or nutrition or, or any other aspect, but using the same kind of tools. So what, what we did is we used a data set that quite a impressive data set that was provided by USAID, the mission in, in the Western Highlands of Guatemala. Their baseline survey when they started the Feed the Future program in the region, which they interview extensively 6,000 farm households, over 6,000, and they gave us a data set. So we could, and it has, it had a lot of information on farm characteristics, and then some individual metrics of nutrition and consumption, et cetera. We decreased the, the survey, had a lot of households that didn't have any agricultural activity, so we took them out, we cleaned a bit, there were some inconsistencies in the, in the data set, like more area on maize than the total area of the farm and things like that. We filtered all that information. So we ended up with a, in any way, considerable data set of 4,800, uh, 4, nearly 800 uh, farm households, distributed in all these different villages. <coughs> so what? What we, went, what we did for uh, understanding the diversity of farming systems, which is normally commonly done, is to make a typology, where we try, when we have diverse farming systems, we try to group them into features that characterize them. For that, for choosing the variables, so there you, you have to select some of the key variables, no? we did some pilot studies with farmers and with technicians to know what were the main features of the farming systems and what were the main difference between the farming systems. No? Uh, so as to select some of the variables, and then through group of techniques, trying to get some farm households. So typology is, for, is commonly used for targeting, uh, and it's not new, and it's not only for agriculture. This is the different shapes of heads of men, and hairdressers use this to define which haircuts will fit better to which type of head. So it's about the same idea, but with agricultural research uh, and development. So if you have an oblong shaped head, you can have a boss cut or a fringe up. <laughs> so what we try to do is about that, but with farming systems characteristics, right? So what, we what normally is done with this is to do a multivariate analysis using principal component analysis to take out the dimensionality of the data and to put some of the variables into a non-dimensional value. And then a hierarchical clustering to make distinctive groups, statistically significant distinctive groups. So the main variables that came out as showing and stressing the diversity of farming system was land on coffee, the density, how many people there were per, per hectare, land on maize, number of crops, that's total arable land, somewhere there is land on maize again, that's uh, land on other crops, there is a TLU there, so it's a tropical livestock unit as a, as a measure for livestock uh, presence. And we ended up with uh, six farm types. Basically, those are the farm types, no? So we got some home garden farming, we considered, because they were, they, they were having a total arable land of 0.1 hectare, so they really have a, just, we can say, a, just a, a, a home garden. 
And then we have specialized maize, a small scale, specialized on coffee, also small scales. Then we have some large scale diversified coffee with up to 2.3 hectares of arable land. You know. Then diversified on other crops. So as you can see, diversified on other crops, they have about the average land size, which is about a bit more than half hectare. But then they have a lot of different crops that they cultivate. And also, uh, if we see the number of crops grown is quite high and the number of in, in polycropping is the highest. <laughs> no? Then we have a diversified maize farming system, this one. So they were, the largest group was the specialized maize, followed by the diversified maize, it's a maize uh, region. No? Uh, and followed by then the specialized coffee and the diversified on other crops and then small groups of the diversified coffee, the very large and the very small. Uh, so well, in the first question of what were the key farming activities on farm types, we found these uh, six distinct farming system types. Uh, and then to go to the next, to the following questions in relation to the food security, understanding the differences of food security for these different types, uh, we, we did an indicator on food availability. So food security in reality is a very large concept that has food availability, access, utilization, and stability. We focus in food availability, and we developed an indicator called potential food availability. Uh, so this is very important for the food security community because you have to say which part are you studying of. They can have available uh, but no access, or they can have availability and access, but badly used, etc. So the potential food security indicator that we developed, and we developed quite some time ago, we adapted uh, little by little in different studies. Uh, we developed it with Romain Frelat, who was here working for us, and we developed it for a context in Africa. Then we used it also in India. No? And basically the idea is a simple indicator. We wanted to do a very back of the envelope quick indicator. Uh, so basically what the indicator does is to make a, a potential food availability taking into account the household energy requirements no? related to the household size and composition and to the total potential food available, which is calculated from the food crops and livestock which are consumed they are transformed into kilocalories. And the livestock products and other products that are sold, what we do is to convert them into as if they buy the most important crop of the farm. In this case, most of the farms were maize. So as to have a conversion into kilocalories, no? and then we call that indirect ki kilocalories. No? And then we made just a balance of if they are producing enough kilocalories within the farm or not. No? And what are the main contributions to the kilocalorie production? So these are the 4,000 and plus farms ordered in terms of their potential food availability. So the highest potential food availability is this one and this is the lowest. No? And we can see in the full population, well first that we have 52% of the households that cannot produce enough kilocalories for the needs of the family with the resources they have. That's partly the reason that we see this amazing migration of this, uh, especially because in this mountainous region there is not many employment opportunities, so migration is, a, is an important local migration or international uh, migration. What we see here also is that, well, food crops, that's the, co the how much the food crops uh, contribute to the food security. So they give quite a lot of the base and we will see a bit more on that. We divided the 4,000 plus farmers into quartiles. So the lowest quartile and the highest quartile in terms of the kilocalorie per capita per day. So basically below this, they are food insecure and above this, they, are, they can be, they can have enough uh, kilocalories. No? And we can see the proportion of different sources of kilocalories for the different farm types. So we see that the, the sorry, not farm types, uh, quartiles. So we see that the highest quartile has an important contribution of cash crops, no? while the lowest quartile has an important contribution of food consumed crops. And then it goes uh, declining. 
obviously this also, they have more contribution of salt, maize or beans or fava food crops. No? And we will go a bit further on that. Uh, to be able to see if the indicator was saying something close to reality, we found in this large survey of the Western Highlands of Guatemala uh, of the USA, two questions. That was, one was in the last month, was there at some point no food because of lack of resources, yes or no? 29% said yes. And in the last month, have you gone to sleep without eating because of lack of food? And 10% said yes. And then we made a chi square to see if our quartiles related to this answer. So we can see that the, that the lowest quartile with a totally food insecure are significantly uh, have a chance to say yes to this question and that the highest uh, quartile have positively significant saying no and negative significant saying yes. The same happens with the no dinner, the second question. No? The lowest quartile had a very important uh, yes uh, answer. So that in some way helped us to validate or to know that our model was not just randomly saying uh, kilocalories when families were not feeling that food insecurity at the end. Uh, so what we try to cross the farm types with the potential food security indicators and then we see, so, uh, so again a cheese square with the different quartiles related to kilocalorie consumption per day or kilocalorie available per day per, per person. And then we see that the, the, the coffee farmers, these are diversified coffee and, and specialized coffee farmers, as well as diversified maize farmers, they were generally in the two largest quartiles, while the home garden farmers, the diversified with others and the specialized in maize farming systems, they were significantly more have more chances to be in the first two quartiles. So we can see that there is this uh, difference between the food security level or the potential food availability level and the type of farming systems. So here they are. Partly this is explained because of the amount of people that is within the, so one of the variables that made farm types was the uh, density, how much available land was per person. So we can see that some low land availability per person no? uh, are in this, in this range and a higher availability land available per person is related to uh, higher potential food availability. We can see for some of the, for the different farm types, we can see the contribution of different aspects. No? So the food consumed, the fruit crops consumed, they were a, a lot in this, in the specialized maize, while in the specialized coffee, the consumption of maize was nearly zero. This is probably better. So here we have the different farm types. No? Uh, and then we see again, this is the specialized coffee. Most of their kilocalories, it comes from selling coffee and they have really little autonomy in terms of food security. No? Diversified coffee farmers, this is interesting and this we see it often is how many farmers they do food crops for consumption until a level of kilocalorie needs and then they start allocating land and, and resources to other production. This most of the, in most of the blue is, is coffee, right? We see some farm households, like the home garden farms, that they have nearly zero kilocalorie production at the household level and a lot it comes from small livestock being sold or consumed at the farm household level. So I, I will try to conclude no, with some of these, some of the findings. So well, we see that maize is critical for food security. In most of the farm household types, they have an important contribution of maize, no, except for the specialized coffee farm households. No. There is low maize, maize yield grains, no, it's, it's between one and two tons. No. And increasing this yield and the stability can be an uh, important opportunity. But for some farm, for some types of farm households, like the specialized maize, that they are producing a lot of maize and they are depending a lot on that maize for food security, 
So for those improving the productivity of maize, maybe an important for the specialized coffee or for the home gardens may not be important to, to improve the productivity of maize. For this, improving this maize uh, yield or increasing its stability, uh, we can think of participatory breeding and seed exchanges, uh, soil, improved soil health and water conservation, improved use of externally and local available inputs, no? Uh, and so a, a lot of the activities related to the Buena Milpa, they were focused on this kind of uh, um, activities. No? <coughs> For farmers that have more land, no? there are some farmers that have more land than the specialized maize, such as the diversified maize and the diversified coffee types. No? So what we could do to improve their food security is to really work on this diversification, like harness efficiency of these diversified systems. No? So we can think of intercropping rotations with beans, fruit trees, and other crops no? uh, for those types of farm households. Then cash crops, notably coffee and vegetables, no? are very important, for, especially for those that are specialized in coffee or specialized in other crops. So this other diversified coffee, diversified maize, and diversified other crops, they also have important contribution of cash crops into their food security. So for these kind of farm households, what we should try to aim is to strengthen in their value chains of these products. They often have problems with price control by other people. Mm -hmm. So they want to, they, we, we should try to improve in terms of their, of their value chains. Probably for improving their food security, we don't necessarily need to improve the, produc the productivity of maize itself, but probably more work on the value chains. Then livestock didn't come as a major source of contribution. Well, there is, is uh, indigenous communities like in the highlands of Chiapas where livestock is not usually consumed, and if there is, it's mainly in the form of sheep in the high areas, there is a lot of poultry, there is some swine, some pigs, no? uh, and especially for some of the farm households that have very little land, like the home garden farmers and the diversified other farmers, the diversified with other crops, uh, increasing this livestock production and making sure that this livestock production uh, is a stable production can improve a lot their food security. So actually part of the Buena Milpa project in the diversification of farming systems uh, work package, let's say, went into uh, chicken uh, breeding and taking care of chicken because it represents for, especially for the most marginalized farmers, an important uh, source of, of kilocalories. Well, this paper, all this, this is better explained in a paper we published uh, last year in, in, in food security about this, uh, so all the methodologies can be checked there. Now what the follow-up of this, we tried to do a spatial distribution of these farm types and of the food security level uh, quartiles. No? So these are the farm types here distributed and then the different quartiles of food security. At the end, because of ethical reasons, USAID could not give us the specific location of the farm households, so we only had at the, at the municipal level aggregated data. Uh, and the region is so mountainous and very, you need a very high resolution to understand the spatial diversity of, uh, of these farm households. So we, we were trying to work with Kai and Jordan Chamberlain to see if we could do some kind of spatial analysis of this so as to USAID and other development agencies to better target geographically. No? Also, in this uh, view of targeting, what we try to do, and this was the thesis of Luis Barba, uh, which what he did, we tried to say, well, instead of making farm types that had a lot of uh, variables included in the principal component analysis, let's try to do a kind of a machine learning algorithm that with few questions, three, four, five questions, allow us to identify in which quartile or which is the situation of food security of a specific farmer. So he tried uh, uh, multiple linear regression, a random forest, and a neural network analysis, and 
at the end, we as this is our good because we had a lot, we had a large uh, data set of nearly 5,000 farmers, so we could use uh, uh, some of them, a thousand, to train the model, and then the rest to see if uh, the model was uh, good. So at the end, we had a, a, a prediction post capability of about 80 percent. No? And with only few questions, like what is the total land available, how, how many people there are in the farm, and how much of the land available is, is, is produced into coffee or into maize. And then we could see the nonlinear interactions between these different uh, variables and identify where are the thresholds of being food secure and being non-food secure. So this, we submitted this paper, it's, it came with uh, minor revisions, but I will I would let, when it's published, I will let Luis to explain more on the more the methodological and mathematical things behind this uh, project. And that's it, and thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer. With a, with a yield of um, uh, one to two tons per hectare, what is the main limiting factor there? Is it fertilizers? If you would give a recommendation to improve yields to double yields, for example, would then a fertilizer program be the advice or something else? Or what do you think? Yeah. Looks a little bit like it, right? Maybe, maybe uh, they have a lot of local organic kind of sources because there is a lot of forest so they do a lot of composting and they and as they have very small land most of them it's quite easy to m to manage the fields in a less dependent to fertilizer they also have land races so they are less efficient for fertilizer use what i would recommend basically will be more into the milpa system trying to polycropping. So we may are making another analysis, I will present soon, I hope, on the efficiency of maize production in polycrop or in monocrop. And we see that polycrop is uh, much more efficient in terms of uh, kilocalorie production and all other nutrients. So Did you do nutrient analysis in the crops, in, pl in plants, so that you can see if uh, different uh, nutrients are in the minimum uh, amounts? Yeah, so we are now conducting another study but with another data set because this didn't have the field level data. In other study that we are doing now and submitting hopefully this month is about the nutrition analysis, not only kilocalories, no? vitamins, proteins, zinc, magnesium, iron, in milpa system versus uh, monocrop. And we see that in kilocalories, Always the polycrop, there is no yield penalty in terms of maize because of the polycrop with an analysis of 400 fields that we did. So in kilocalories, always is better as there is no penalty, penalty of the maize yield. Any yield of any additional crop will improve the kilocalorie production of at the plot level. And then when we see the different nutrients, the advantages of milpa system or polycrops, Basically, the polycrops that come out as more efficient are maize, potato, bean, or maize, potato, fava bean as a more adequate nutrition characteristics. So I will promote, in that study, we found that 30% of the fields were on maize monocrop and 70% in maize polycrop. We have to understand why. Why is people doing monocrop when they were traditional system is polycrop and it shows uh, production advantages. When I have talked with farmers, they told me like in a specific fields it's too windy and if we put to a bean, then the, the, the maize will lodge. Uh, so I, I will go for more polycropping. You know? Market access is very difficult. So fertilizer as such doesn't seem to be a, a important option, no? especially also because they are having so small land that they will need to buy fertilizers on a kilogram basis. No? Um, and I think that improving soil and water conservation is, uh, is key. The way they do, so there, are, there is scope for 
making instead of they make one row and then a step and one row step and one row. I've seen fields with two rows step, two rows, and they only till within the like a little terrace, and that changes everything. So I think water retention because this is also a very drought prone area. You know, it's now included in the dry corridor of Central America because of the climatic viability. So s I will go into more soil and water conservation and uh, polycropping you know, rather than fertilizer use. Especially because also we, with analysis of John Helling, there is uh, nearly non uh, maize uh, salt. There is no markets for, for maize production. And so then they don't want to necessarily invest uh, monetary resources uh, in terms of to produce uh, more maize. They will be ready to do some more labor because there is a lot of labor per area. But investing the, the little monetary resources to improve maize yield, I see it difficult. Santiago, in the, in the analysis, in the typology, how age and gender is being considered for the different uh, household mm. farmers? Because I'm wondering if the ones that are under uh, really food sec insecurity mm -hmm. is because uh, they are old people that have been left behind, <laughs> uh, yeah. the ones that have migrated, exactly. or if or uh, they are women that yeah. don't have access to other type yeah, of yeah. technologies. Yeah, uh, we didn't include it as an input variable for, for the typology, partly because we wanted to keep it on continuous uh, variables and always the gender, when we add uh, categorical variable, then the analysis is less robust for only one feature of the entire farming system. But then we compared and there were more, yeah, we, we found there were more, the most important factor explaining the differences and the food security was uh, ethnic group first. Uh, so the, the some ethnic groups were especially marginalized than others, no? That has a long history of displacement of people in the civil war, and it has a long history in Guatemala of that. And then we found some gender aspects, especially in the home garden farming. There we have a high proportion of women and old uh, household heads. And it's partly because there is the amazing migration, no? There is a lot of, so there is, we see here we are only taking into account the agricultural production. That was the main comment of reviewers of saying, what are you doing trying to explain food security through agriculture when these people they are having 0.7 hectares as an average, they are migrating as hell, and there is obviously 52% of the population that cannot feed themselves with the uh, with, uh, local resources, so every, obviously a lot is coming in. And that's the reason that we went more into nutrition because we want to see, okay, what are they actually eating? So we could see some aspects related to gender in some of the of the types and of the quartiles of food security. And the, yeah, the old and the woman and some ethnic groups are the always the most marginalized. With Carolina, we did with another data set in the same region, a typology of only social inclusion aspects. So we really took only aspects of age, of ethnic group, of education level, and of uh, gender, some variables, and then we classified farming systems in terms of feminized, aged farming systems, or young entrepreneurial farming systems. And at the end, the, the typology is a construction of how do we want to divide the reality as the heads of the hairstyler we know that each head is different, so they make classes just to, at the end you can make classes out of what you, we wanted to keep the classes really related to a more systems approach in terms of what are the limits of the system, the area, the number of animals, etc. What are the different components of the system, so which crops, which animals, and there are some variables in relation to flows, what, how much is salt, how much is consumed inside. We saw that salt is very little, only the cash crops. No? As a um, comment on the question of Martin 
uh, fertilizer were the solution. It's very similar, uh, similar the experience you have in Guatemala with what we have in uh, Mexican highlands. We've tried fertilizer, but it actually doesn't really help much in production, but things like polycultures or uh, rotations, uh, soil conservation, those are the things that yeah. can really help with food security, with improving uh, profitability, while fertilizers, also organic fertilizers, they're expensive. They're a lot of work to carry to the fields up in the mountains, and they generally don't have much effect on yield. So we should more focus on the on the on the rotation and the polyculture uh, angle to improve those systems. Now my issue is basically on the analytics, right? Because we are a science organization. So we want to know what is limiting uh, the yields of those crops. It could be, uh, you know, the major uh, fertilizer components, yeah, yeah. Uh, organic or whatever, doesn't matter. It can be the soil, it can be water, water it can yeah. be the varieties, right? Because maybe these varieties cannot yield more in the environment. Exactly. Or yeah. it's the plant density, those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. And the mul multiple cropping, I did a lot of my work on, on uh, intercropping, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. mainly in Africa. Um, you know, it's very complicated to analyze why farmers are doing intercropping. But we figured out, we thought always biological advantage, that's why farmers are doing it. But what we found in Tanzania, for example, that they were intercropping, not because of um, uh, biological control and those kind of things, but basically because of market. Because when they have yeah. maize and sesame systems, uh, the sesame, yeah. uh, when they harvested the maize <coughs> and the sesame, the sesame, they, that's what they could sell for a good price. Because yeah. when all the maize was harvested, the maize prices were extremely low. Yeah. And um, so also in environments where, you know, they had no access to markets, only vendors came in exactly. some cash. And uh, so these, th these systems are complex. So I like it very much that you try to do a complete systems analysis mm -hmm. to figure out what's going on there. Yeah, 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 I, I agree. It's, uh, yeah, well, a lot of the multi-cropping has to do also with risk. No? This place is, has all their risks. They have frost, they have uh, floods, they have everything. No? So a lot of the multi-cropping is for risk and compensation between food crops, cash crops, very local markets. We tried, uh, and we, I think it's, we, and I want to write a project about that already circulate to some colleagues into uh, milpa with arboles frutales, with fruit trees. So there is a lot of experience in Mexico on saying put fruit trees, especially in this slope land, fruit trees to very dense and using the straw of maize to retain soil so as to slowly make some sort of terraces. And not many because they don't have much land. They don't want to sacrifice a lot of land in terms of to put fruit trees and the markets are very imperfect. There are some middlemen that come and they set the price and stuff like that. But more taking into account the nutrition part. No? So in principle, these trees should improve the water holding capacity of the, of the soils. No? And then they will provide some additional vitamins. So I believe it's more on that, on that lines of the diversification. No? Well, if there is no questions online. Uh, we had a short, no? Good. Thank you very much. Good. Hope you liked it. Yeah. yeah.